All right, welcome back. It is a technophile edition of The Breakfast. It's time for us to take a look at the headlines on some major dailies. And then off the press with our guest, Chris Kendewando, member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK, is ready to join us on Off the Press this morning. But first, let's look at what the headlines are saying. We'll begin with the Punch newspaper. The Punch newspaper leads with Angote Refinery Petrol Heats Market July, FG to save 7 trillion naira. Had the, the writers there, plant project export to 53 African countries and to toxic fuel supply, Dangote. Buhari says refinery is a game changer. Emir Felix projects 12,000 megawatts power. There you have a picture there, President Muhammad Buhari, uh, Haji Aliko Dangote, uh, Governor Samuel of Lagos, so many dignitaries there, everyone who is everyone <laughs> in Nigerian government is there, was there yesterday. It was a very colorful event. Nigeria put, you know, in a lamb light there in a very positive light. It's very beautiful to see. And so going down, you have my admin boosted Navy's capacity with 20 ships. Buhari, details of that can be found on page 43. Operators fault removal of NAMA managing director. 26, page 26 is where you find details of that. Governors elect protests as outgoing governors shun transition panels. You find details of that on page 44 of the Punch newspaper. And on the masthead, you have Tribunal rejects live broadcast. Supreme Court decides anti tinubu suit Friday. Page 2 is where you find details of that. From the Punch newspaper, we're moving to the next, which is the Nation newspaper. The Nation newspaper leads with petrol, diesel, others to flow from Dangote refinery July. And the writer there, 40% of output from the 650,000 barrels per day facility for export. Above the masthead, you have Sirica, more heads to roll in aviation agencies. 2.2 billion Naira terminal takes off. You have details of that on the inside of the nation newspaper. Tinubu will support Navy, says Buhari. Details of that on page 25. President signs social investment agency bill, others, and why judiciary must resist technical judgments. Page 13 is where you find details of that. All right, so from the Nation newspaper, we move to the next, which is the Daily Trust. The Daily Trust newspaper, expectedly, is leading with Angote Refinery, a game changer, is how President Buhari has described it here on uh, the Daily Trust newspaper. The writers, flags off Lake Chad oil drilling today. Nigeria to be self-sufficient, Dangote, to generate $21 billion, employ over 100,000 youth, African company for Africa by an African entrepreneur, ECOWAS. Details of that on page four of the Daily Trust newspaper. Going down, you have Sudan crisis. Nigerian pilgrims to pay $100 airfare hike. And right down, you have youth protesting just against killings, call for self-defense. Details of that is on page six. Elrufai deposes two monarchs, district head. Details of that is on page six. And Supreme Court rules on suit seeking to Nubu's Shatima's uh, disqualification today. Page 13 is where you find that on the Daily Trust. From the Daily Trust, we move to the Guardian newspaper. The Guardian newspaper is leading with telcos. Rising revenues, profits, 
fail to reflect in quality of service. You find details of that on page six of the Guardian newspaper. 18.5 billion dollar Angote refinery to release first products in August. Well, some other newspaper did say July, but the Guardian is saying it's going to be in August. So you have the pictures there of the dignitaries who were present at the commissioning of the Angote refinery yesterday in Lagos. PEPC dismisses Atiku Abis request or Abis request for live telecast of proceedings. Details inside the Guardian newspaper. Relief for travelers as Buhari commissions second Niger Bridge today. Second Niger Bridge will be commissioned today. And up above the masthead, you have Buhari's fragile pieces. More hardware, less safety. Well, that's the much will be taken from the front page of the Guardian newspaper. And as I told you earlier, I have my guest analyst, Chris Kendewandu. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. Chris Kendewandu is a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. But Chris is joining us from... Chris, are you in Port Harcourt, Abuja, or Lagos? Because you're a man about town. Where are you I'm joining us from this morning? I'm back in Lagos. <laughs> oh, you're back, back in, in Lagos. Welcome back to Eku. Thank you very All much. right, let's start off with the good news that every Nigerian is talking about. Indeed, all Africans, I imagine, are talking about what Dangote is doing for us. So the, the Punch newspaper leads with Dangote refinery, petrol heats market July, FG to save 7 trillion naira. Let's start with that. Yes, I like um, the way one of the papers put it. Um, uh, Dangote refinery, a game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, that, this is a game changer in our in the energy sector, which have been comatose for years now due to the fact that uh, we don't have um, working refineries. We have four refineries in Nigeria, uh, government owned through the NNPC, the one in Kaduna, the one in Wari, and also two in Portacourt, the uh, refinery one and two. Uh, but none of them is functional, which has led to our importing over 95% of our daily consumption uh, of petroleum products in over two decades now. It was not what it, that was not what we were used to in the 80s and the 90s. That, that is where we find ourselves. And year in, year out, the federal government pumping millions and millions of dollars into turnaround maintenance, which was never done um, became a conduct pipe for some individuals in government and then to um, steal our common wealth. So, and we've seen the prices skyrocketing on a daily basis because of importation, and we are left with market forces uh, recently been the fight, the war between Ukraine and the Russia, which has also skyrocketed the prices of uh, petroleum products. And where we are, the seems to be the only country in the world where we produce crude oil in large quantities that import uh, petroleum. So this is a game changer for me, and is a welcome development. Six hundred and fifty thousand barrels of petroleum products daily basis that should be able to uh, meet our daily consumption and even provide more for export. So what government could not do in about twenty years, mm. what the Buhari government could not do in eight years of promising Nigerians to provide refineries, uh, one individual have done it. So now ask your question, is Dangote bigger than the Nigerian government? Mm. But the good news also that is that Nigeria has 20% equity in Dangote uh, refinery, meaning that uh, our own money is there. Um, so congratulations to Nigeria. And it's not coming, it's also coming at an auspicious time when we are tinkering with the issue of removing the big elephant in the room, which is the um, subsidy regime, mm -hmm. which has also another uh, area of uh, siphoning money. We know how much we are losing on a monthly basis through um, this subsidy. And the, 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 the incoming government said that they are going to give the ground running by removing 
petroleum subsidy once it takes over. So that is the Tinubu's government mm. who said that. So if it comes in in May and uh, we leave by June, that would. So uh, it is coming at a very very uh, auspicious time, and uh, that will save Nigeria a lot of money, which save us a lot of uh, foreign exchanges, which cannot be channeled into other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but the whole of this euphoria, I have my fear. My fear as an individual, as a Nigerian, is the fact that uh, monopoly may come into play. Mm -hmm. And that is meaning that the equity is going to determine how much petroleum products is going to be sold in Nigeria. And that is a, without serious competition, that is, for me is the challenge. So we are at the beck and call of Dangote. The way we are going to regulate the prices. That is what we don't know for now. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point you've made. However, we are first of all excited that it would appear that the days of long queues, fuel crisis, adulterated imported fuels and all of that may be a thing of the past going forward. Um, you have raised a very important point about monopoly. You know, as of 2020, uh, about 17 companies were given valid licenses to do what Dangote has done. And we're wondering why they have not kicked off yet. If the, do you see this Dangote coming online, uh, coming up, encouraging these others into um, doing theirs, building their own refineries and, and reducing monopoly? Yes, there are so many factors. Um, theirs is not uh, as large as the, that of Dangote one. Theirs are centralized uh, to a large extent, and uh, they are called uh, the Morabaka. I've forgotten them. They are, they are just smaller refineries. Mm. And um, yes, um, the reasons for they are not taking off. One of the reasons they give it is one inappropriate pricing of petroleum uh, products in Nigeria. And they believe that if they go into that. Uh, venture, they are not going to make profits. Every businessman goes into the business with the idea of making profit. And so if it's not, if they look at it and they look at the templates and the ROI for them is not worth investing, then there's nobody's going to invest. So it is also the issue of this so-called uh, subsidy removal. So now that we are going to face the reality uh, with the subsidy removal, I have initially thought that we should start it gradually, but the way it's going, with the Dangote refinery place, I think that we just do away with the subsidy refinery, which has become a huge means of um, tiffery by our, our big boy, our big people. And also, we've already been also be able to cut down to a large extent the crude oil theft, uh, especially within the Niger Delta area, with mm -hmm. the implementation of um, the services of um, Tompolo, who has been able to be able to. Uh, be able to name this in the board. Um, but good news also is that I had, and I read somewhere, that another refinery of over 200,000 uh, per barrel capacity is also being um, planned for um, acquired bond states by BUA. That is a rival uh, uh, um, individual to, uh, to Dangote. If you know BUA very well, uh, the one BUA cement, BUA group. Another one is being planned. I don't know when that will take off. It's good to take up. Then Nigeria is good to not to be only self sufficient in um, production of petroleum products and byproducts, not just petroleum, because we are talking about petroleum. Petro yes. It's not just about petroleum. Yes, the byproducts. We are, yes, byproducts. We are talking of kerosene, we are talking of diesel, we are talking of aviation fuel, especially the aviation fuel as well. Mm -hmm. If you look at the price of kerosene now, it has skyrocketed to the point that you know, people in the rural area cannot be put up. So it's not just about. Uh, Dangote Petroleum is not just about petroleum, it is about diesel, it is about kerosene, it is also about aviation. And other so byproducts that we don't even talk about because we don't use yes. them on a regular. Yeah, we know that byproducts include the one that you use for even your Vaseline and the rest of them exactly. that we use. Exactly. And the rest of them, so uh, used for plastic, uh, polythenes, and the rest of them. So it's a very, very huge expense. And it's the biggest in Africa. But it's not the people have been making the mistake that it's the biggest refinery in the world. No, it's not the it's not the biggest refinery in the world. It's just the seventh biggest in the world. But, but Gupta, Gupta Sanjay did trade. say uh, Gupta yes, Sanjay Gupta it's Sanjay trade. of uh, Dangote did say that it is if you, you know it is the biggest in the world. I guess it's you know just no, um, no, no, no. No, on the spur of the let's, moment let's, excitement no. and all of that. No, no, let, let us educate our viewers. Is petrol is refinery trade? That's what is called refinery trade. If you are talking okay. of re refinery trade, then Dangote is the biggest in the world. But if you're talking of in totality, 
of the biggest refinery in the world, the biggest is in, in India, and they produce about 1.2 million barrels of petroleum products on a daily basis. That's just two times the size of Dangote. But that does not remove the fact that we have a very, very big investment in our corridor. Well, thank you so much for that um, information there. Well, let's move from the Punch newspaper to the Delhi Trust. Uh, above the masthead, you have experts want to Nubu to insist on synergy among security forces. Well, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, signature and we were saying it, that the problem we've had is inter-agency uh, collaboration that has been the problem of Nigeria. And that is why we, we see um, this high level of insecurity between the police doesn't share uh, uh, knowledge and uh, share they are this thing with the army. Army doesn't share with Navy. Navy doesn't share with Air Force. Same with uh, uh, civil defense and the rest of Everybody is doing his own thing. And you cannot be able to work like that. In fact, it came to a point that the minister, I think the minister of um, defense, or I, I can't remember which of them, sometime ago, a, few, uh, a year or two, it cried out that the problem is that we're not having interagency uh, collaboration. And there's supposed to be a coordinating uh, uh, person in charge of that. So I look forward to interagency uh, corporations among the top security agencies so that this problem we are presently facing uh, in in area of uh, security in the land can be. By the time everybody comes has and puts us together, we can be able to solve the problem. But may not the, 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 the challenge for me now and the those exclusion um, if, uh, um, story coming out now is that insurgency has resurfaced in most parts of the north, especially in Plateau State. We've just had that. You, you just took that out of my mouth, Chris. I was yes, going to. I was waiting for you to land so I could yes. bring in yes. the that headline yes. uh, coming from Plateau State, where the youth are protesting in just against the killings. You know, it happened in Mango. Very horrible thing there. Yes, we had that in the past. In the last few days. Over 130 people have been killed. 130 people in Metro State. Um, the Heisman are, uh, are running riot also in Benue State. Now, children and farmers are being beheaded. They're not just killing them, they're oh. beheading them. This is crucial. This is not something that you want to hear. In, in some countries, some governments um, get rid of, are put down just by the death of just two or three people. But here we are counting what we just count in number, not even in lives. And we're so, not even uh, officially I, at war, so to, you know, so to speak. We're not really, uh, we're not at war, and you have Nigerians dying in their hundreds. Even the countries that are, are in war, in Ukraine and in Russia, you don't see them, you don't see where they say uh, two, uh, 100 people died. In one day. There was an attack, and then three people died, four people died. Even the mass shootings, you see five people died, seven people died. Not in this magnitude. And may not the irony of it is that that is what is being reported. And I tell you that the, uh, the number is more than double that. Um, um, Vanguard came out with a report um, at the weekend that during the eight year reign of President Muhammad Bukhari, 63,111 Nigerians were killed by bandits. Can you do that math? 63 million Nigerians were killed by terrorists and bandits. That is where that they were able to uh, have people. Exactly. It is more, far, far more than it is far, far more than that. So this is a country that we are not. This is not a country in war uh, or at war. But it seems that we are at war with each other. So I hope that the incoming government will take security as a priority because everything hinges on security. If you, when you lose out in security, then it affects ever that because it affects uh, economy, it affects social lives, it affects agriculture, and even foreign uh, investment direct foreign investment. Nobody wants to come and invest in a country that, you know, that is not secure. Not only that, the lives of people are not secure. Also, look at what happened a few days ago in Anambra State. Some people working with the U.S. embassy. We are killed. Not only killed, but they are burned. Mm. That shows you the level at which we have degenerated in this country. And it's, it is not something to smile about. It is. It, the word you use, degenerated. You know, I remember the one of Plateau State touches me personally because Plateau State is is, is not, used to be known as a home of peace and terrorism. And then suddenly, from nowhere, that peace was stolen from them 
and that state just got violated to the point where we're having what we're having today, where you have hundreds, hundreds of Plateau indigents killed on a daily basis. It is so unfortunate. And we do hope that the incoming government will take the issue of security as something very paramount, hit the ground running with it. All right, so let's move to the nation newspaper. Above the masthead, you have Sirica, more heads to roll in aviation agencies. Yes, more heads to roll, but I thought that that of Sirica would have been the best to roll, as far as I'm concerned, because this was a man that promised went to the United Kingdom with so much uh, funfair, wasted our money, had end currency, uh, naira, pounds, and dollars. <laughs> to uh, to launch a marabond uh, in Nigeria, spent so much money at that point. I think at the point they were saying that we spent about three million dollars of pounds just um, putting together the launch of the air Nigeria. Now he's living. It's just about five days, and he's living, and he has not produced. There is no single air. Uh, he told us that this this uh, this airline will fly. Nothing on ground to show. Even the uh, even the parts. Uh, Sign with the Ethiopia Island is not taking off, although they have some um, challenges, especially uh, in court with uh, a local airline operators. But he has not been able to do what he ought to have done. To me, uh, on that aspect, is a total failure. So he was talking about his going to do. I thought that his would have been the first to roll, so that other, because when the head is rotting, every part of the body uh, is going to be affected. So. Uh, just uh, uh, dismissing the uh, chief executives in the various agencies of uh, the aviation space sector is not uh, good enough. On beds, um, uh, consensus, yes, I know that uh, we are making some progress, but we can also take it away that uh, we are able to make some progress in the area of um, the uplifting the, uh, the various some key um, uh, airports in Nigeria. Uh, that I recommend this government. They took up from where the good Lord Jonathan government started. They started it. And then most of our airports now, you can say, well, they, they look like what with serious international standard, go to that of Lagos and some other Abuja. This government, to a larger extent, have done. But the minus here, uh, since we are talking about the minister, this is his inability to be able to equip Nigerians the promise of giving Nigeria a national career. Um, that in this service. So I, I hope that the incoming government, well, it's not just repeating us a, a national career. Let it not be what it was during the Nigeria Airways days. Um, Nigeria Airways at a point, largest air fleet in the whole of Africa. In fact, Ethiopia, Egypt, and so many other countries came here to understand how we did it. But within uh, years, we were able to figure that out that just as we have done with so many other sectors. And, um, and part of it was because government itself killed that sector. You see somebody, a director or a government official, going to London on a, on a weekly, a weekend basis with their girlfriends and families and not paying um, airfares. That's a part of what killed Nigeria West. But I hope that we'll be able to get it because it's a thing of pride that mm -hmm. we have an airline, a yeah, national a airline. National airline, national, airline, national carrier. Yes. Mm -hmm. National carrier is a, is a thing of pride. All right. So let's move to the Daily Trust. Right at the bottom, you have El Rufai deposes two monarchs, district head. Well, you know, as much as I want to talk about El Rufai, I don't think there's anything much to talk about El Rufai. El Rufai is going to um, say it's going to be, if you like, you can dispose of the heads there. My own main concern here, I should be looking at this. The court ruling yesterday, uh, that is of much interest to me, and that of El uh, where the issue of live broadcast for the presidential election petition court uh, was uh, rejected by the court, and the court gave its reasons. Uh, I know, as a person, uh, a graduate of law, I know that it's very difficult for that tribunal or the court to be able to accede to that for several reasons, um, apart from that of security, uh, so that we don't turn the court into a jamboree. It is not an Oputa panel, uh, as most people have uh, tried to say, but. Uh, uh, it will be difficult for the uh, uh, tribunal uh, judges of the tribunal to do their job in such a manner because there is a lot of drama and lives, and also the security of lives and proper of those involved, especially key witnesses. But that is what Nigerians would have loved to see. Um, most Nigerians were for that because they want to see the transparency 
in the job of the tribunal to be able to make sure that everything uh, but I also say that uh, they shouldn't be worried because we are having journalists, we have our colleagues um, in, in, in attending those tribunals and on a daily basis they will be feeding us back with uh, giving us feedback from the uh, tribunal being as what so it won't be much of a problem. So uh, the tribunal came up yesterday that it will not be able to allow that. How that is going to affect the perception is another thing. Uh, but the, uh, it is not Nigerians that are on trial now. For me, it's the court and the judiciary that is on trial. And the ability to be able to redeem themselves with some of the negative um, uh, impact and negative uh, connotations by Nigerians and um, uh, some of the things that Nigeria feel about the Nigerian the judiciary. This is the time for the Nigerian judiciary, of which I'm part of, to be able to redeem itself. And I hope that um, a lot will be done. Don't forget also, uh, I think today or a few days' time, the Supreme Court is going to give a judgment on a pre election matter. So people let it not be confused. People feel that it's a, it's a, 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 a judgment on the election. No, it is not a, on the election, it's a pre election matter. The time mean they are turned by a suit filed by Atikwa Bubaka on the legitimacy, legitimacy of um, the president elect to contest the 2023 presidential election. That is what the Supreme Court is going to determine and going to give judgment on, not the, on the election itself, so that people don't get it. Pre election matters to the main hearings, the main matters go. Yeah, pre-election matters. That is it. Yeah, when are we moving from pre-election to the main matters on ground? Mm -hmm. The main matters is what is part is already ongoing. All the all the all the all the people involved, um, both from the Labour Party, the APC, and the PDP, have already um, uh, forwarded their uh, petitions and uh, defence. The court in itself has been part of part of that. Uh, this thing is what happened yesterday when you hear that we are the five judges of that um, of that panel of that court came out with the ruling. Now that they are true with the ruling on the um, live telecast, mm -hmm. then the, uh, the 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 issue is on the ground. They hit the ground running. Don't forget forget that they have a time frame. It is one hundred and eighty days, days. Mm -hmm. and yes, one hundred eighty days, and a judgment must be given. Within the next 180 days, that's what they have. The time frame they have to be able to do that judgment. So uh, we are looking forward to that. Okay, let's. But let's that, that notwithstanding, mm. they we also have to note that the president elect will be sworn in on Monday, the 29th of May, 2023. Uh, there is no going back on that. It has nothing to do with the a petition in the, uh, the tribunal in court. If at the end of it all, the tribunal in its wisdom says that Tinubu didn't win the election well and good but that cannot be uh, i can you can rest assured that that will not be done with by the 29th of may which is next week monday when the president that will be um, so on well, what about this supreme court uh, that's supposed to decide on this anti tunubu suit today what do we know about that chris yes you know there's a <laughs> you know the beauty of uh, law is that everybody try to get a piece of the cake and uh, when you know, when, when the election finished, uh, I, I, I made a joke uh, on social media. I said, uh, the party agents have taken their own. Uh, the agbaros have done job. Uh, most of the voters have collected their own. The A's have collected. Now the election has gone. It is now time for us, those of us that uh, are in the judiciary, to be able to pick our own piece of it. And that is what is happening. So all sorts of petition is coming here and there. Uh, I know that a lot of people are coming up. Also, just to make sure that uh, uh, the president elect is not elected, uh, mean, uh, I'm sorry, is not sworn in on the 29th of May. Mm. Um, so, there are a lot of, lot of positions. I know that one somebody uh, by the suit, uh, but uh, the fact remains that I don't see that happen because uh, you cannot put something on nothing already. That is an election petition court that is in place, and I don't see a Supreme Court try to annul or try to put aside the job of that. Uh, which don't forget that that tribunal is, is, is also a child of law. And it was the Supreme Court that put um, the CJN that put together all the tribunals and uh, the judges. So, uh, but let's wait and see what is uh, the 
what the Supreme Court is going to say. But I can, can be rest assured, you can take that to the bank. Uh, May 29th is, is sacrosanct. <laughs> it is sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. There's no going back. All right, let, let's still look at something on the Punch newspaper. Going down, you have governors elect protests as outgoing governors shown transition panels. Uh, they are big boys now. What do you expect? Let's say they are big boys. They feel that uh, they are big boys. Um, but that is how we rule. But this is not the first time. Uh, well, even in the established uh, democracies, uh, when uh, you forgot what happened between Joe Biden and the uh, former president, uh, what's his name of US? Uh, Trump. Uh, Donald Trump. Ah, Donald Trump. Did not even hand over a single paper <laughs> to uh, Bush. <laughs> in the man, uh, as, of, as of the last, the last thing that he won the election. So, but the fact is that uh, it's supposed to be a seamless uh, exercise. It's supposed to be because government is a continuum, and that's what it ought to be. And um, uh, governors uh, at every level that's supposed to have a transition team to work with the income, the outgoing is supposed to work with. The, um, but I don't know why uh, that is not happening, especially in states where you have governors having their so-called "quote unquote" uh, selected or anointed sons uh, 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 taking over. It may just be between those, yes, those that um, where you have opposition parties taking over and rest of them. But that is what it is. But, but the fact remains that whether they are part of the screening, part of the transition or transmission on 29th of May about 22 new governors will take over in Nigeria. Hmm. That one is also I like the word you use, sacrosanct. You know? That is sacrosanct. 22 new governors will be sworn in the 29th of May. But what will happen after that, it is what we don't understand. The fact is that there's going to be a lot of politicking. Even the so-called governors that were anointed hmm. or appointed or selected by certain governors who won the election, we can rest assured that within the next few months, they're going to fall out. Go and check through the history. It has always happened. It happened in Kanu. It happened in Abia. It happened so many things in the past. So the fact that you, got, you anointed or appointed or nominated somebody as your successor does not necessarily mean that the person is going to toe the line. When they get in there, they become a man of their own, mm -hmm. and you will see what happens. So uh, that was always said that it's right to give Nigerians the opportunity to say, elect who they want to be, not just this selective system. But um, five, six days to go, this governors will, will be sworn in and they will hit the ground running. So if the former governors were not part of this team, um, that is not a problem. It can also be a rest assured that ESCC is going to go after some of them. Um, ESCC already have their yeah. dossier. He has written but, all uh, of them. The ESCC yes, has yes. written all of them. And Matawale yes, is so very, 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 yes. Yeah, Man, no, they are fine. Don't pile on top of the yes. <laughs> so, Some people go chop breakfast. Some people go chop breakfast. After, after, after. And they're also ready to fight back. Matawale is also pointing at the EFCC that uh, they have evidence that, uh, you know. That, yeah, that demand. That demand allegedly. Why yeah, power is, is, is not clean, too. Yeah, the man, why the, man, the EFCC demand chop 7 billion naira. The man is accusing, um, accusing the EFC chairman power of um, trying to collect two million dollars. dollars back. But after May 29, we will see who will cry first. So yeah. let's wait and see who will <laughs> <who are, who laughs> It's interesting the things happen. playing out. Well, yeah. let, let's look at this issue of Sudan crisis. I, I, I was shocked to see Sudan crisis, Nigerian pilgrims to pay $100 airfare hike. Well, what's that about, Chris? Mm, I, I think probably it has to do with um, uh, flight schedules. Uh, you know, Sudan is very, very close to, um, to the, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Mecca. Uh, most of them are not. Uh, most of the flights, I believe, I want to pass it through Sudan and Khartoum. Uh, they fly over. Uh, but the situation of things on ground, I don't know whether it is safe for most of them to fly through Khartoum, pass through Khartoum airspace. For security reasons so what that means that is probably that this airline might take a longer route that is my personal opinion i have mm -hmm. not read that that's my personal opinion and um so that could be the reason for the rise in uh, extra 100 dollars for pilgrims going to saudi arabia because of the uh, crisis in that too. don't forget also that it is uh, unnoticed that one um 25 percent of one fourth of um sudanese 
are Nigerians. I'm sure you're hearing, you may be hearing that for that. Mm -hmm. They are Nigerians. Or, yes, yes, yes. They are Nigerians. Wow. They are Nigerians. Yes, about 25% of yes, Nigerians or Nigerians of, of Niger Sudanese of Nigerian origin. Because of the closeness of Sudan to uh, Mecca and um, Saudi Arabia, what happens is that most Nigerians pass through Sudan mm. to go for a Hajj. After Hajj, on their way back, most of them settle down. They settle back in Sudan. They don't come back to Nigeria. Wow. So that is why you have yeah that's why I have a large number of so most of them settled there. there. So they have two are children, they have um, families raised and the rest of them. It's just this crisis that made some of them. That is why when we are talking like when we talk and say government say they want to um, move five thousand uh, Nigerian students. And the question I've always asked: What of the other Nigerians that are there? It's not just only states that are Nigerian students that are there. There are so many Nigerians in Sudan who are doing legitimate work or have published. So Sudan, at a point, it was also said that Sudan has the highest number of Nigerians in the diaspora. Some people have been saying it was US, it was UK. No. Research has shown that it's Sudan. So there is a high concentration of Nigerians because of their connection with Sudan, because of the cultural as well as the relig religious link with Sudan. That is why you have that high number of Nigerians, some that have even forgotten who forgotten about Nigeria and now as uh, Sudanese uh, nationals. So the height, the height in that... The and probably un unregistered. Probably no, unregistered, course, undocumented. Of course, so many of them. It's not only... Most Nigerians, when they travel, they don't go to the embassy to register their presence. They don't. United Kingdom, United States, uh, Russia, name it. It's only when they have problems. That they remember they have an embassy and that has always been the problem i think that the issues the minister of foreign affairs as well as the uh, uh diaspora should be able to look at henceforth a ability to be able to make sure that all nigerians wherever they are are well documented so that if they find themselves in this kind of crisis we can be able to know that is also part of the problem where we cannot plan hmm. when we have crisis during crisis period we cannot plan because we don't even know how many people are going to plan for that in itself is an issue most Nigerians also, uh, I know that a, a lot of Nigerians get to these countries legitimately. Don't, don't, don't take that away. That there are also so many that go there illegitimately. And that is why they keep away from being themselves available and trying to register themselves with relevant authorities. And that's not the problem. All right, Chris, before we go, let's take a look at this story on the Guardian newspaper. Relief for travelers as Buhari commissioned second Niger Bridge today. You know, so that one touched me now. <laughs> <laughs> I say no reason. If you don't talk, I could talk. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the it is a very That's serious me. one. I was excited yeah. when I saw the headline. Yeah, to me, it's very exciting. And uh, for long, we from the start is have been talking about the midpoint, second Niger Bridge. And finally, we got it. And uh, if there's going to be any legacy, one of the legacies that never this government is. The second Niger Bridge. So many successful governments in the past have used that as a bait for us. Those of course for the South is vote for us, we get second Niger. As if it is a favor you are doing, as if the South is not part of Nigeria. Mm. But good enough. This are, yes, it's true. Because if you continue telling me, oh, vote for us, I will give you second Niger Bridge. I'll not ask you how many times did I vote for you to get give Lagos third Mendel mm. Third Mendel Bridge. The one in Benue State, that means that they didn't vote to get it. The one, the long bridge in Lokoja, how many times did you say they should vote for you to get that long bridge between Lokoja and the Abuja, the Alex Abuja? So that shouldn't even be in, in the midst. But the fact is that finally the second Niger bridge is coming on stream. It is going to ease the movement within, between, in between the south south, the south east, the southwest, and so many other parts of the country linking up. So it is a good development. And I commend the government for this. And um, I hope that this will not ease up. The Niger Bridge, that Kotlinga First Niger Bridge has been there for close to 40 or 50 years, over 50 years now. And um, I don't know how hard it has been able to, make, able to maintain that. But the new Second Niger Bridge will be able to ease up traffic that is perennial along that route from Asaba, especially between Aba, Delta State, and the Southeast. So we commend the president. Uh, for the kind gesture um, as, as a parting gift. Uh, Perhaps one of the good government. things, one of the good things that will be said about the outgoing administration, because as this administration is winding down, a lot of people have, it's received lots of knocks, with regards to the economy, with regards to security, with regards to 
virtually almost every sector, uh, lots of people are saying different things. How would you score this administration of uh, President Muhammadu Buhari as they leave office in a few days' time? What's, what would be your score? What would be your assessment? If I do, you will not forgive me. So <laughs> let me be this. No, I, 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 I don't need to be the judge of that. No, 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 let me just tell you, let me say this. Personally, if I put it these are the promises that are made in 2015, uh, 2015 by the president, then I, I, I will, I'm going to score this government at just a 30 percent. But don't forget it has its challenges. It challenges of How many percent the, did you say? I said three zero. Three three zero. Mm. Three zero. Mm. Because I, I just, just took two, three critical areas. One, we we'll talk about the petrol sector, the, uh, the energy sector, which he promised that is going to build four refineries or so on a yearly basis. None was built. He talked promised Nigeria that is going to give us 10 mega, uh, 10,000 megawatts every year. Within eight years, we are expecting 80 megawatts. We are still running at uh, 4,000 4, megawatts. So that's zero. He talked about uh, employment. He promised Nigeria that is going to add about 1.5 million um, employment uh, uh, employment uh, within the system every year. That has not been achieved. Then you also look at our poverty. Nigeria has moved those uh, from uh, those under poverty line from I don't know about 80 million or 70 million then to about 130 million. So if I use those indices to, uh, to be able to uh, score, then it is a total failure. We also in secure security area. It didn't do well as far as I'm concerned. Then a change, look at the economy. What was the naira to the dollar when it came in? Hmm. How much is it now? But on um, infrastructure, yes, I've done so. Just I've talked about that of uh, um, Vanaija, the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. I will score him very well. If I'm going to use that to score uh, Paris government, I'll score him over 80%. That expressway is just between OPIC and Bega that is remaining. You know, if you take a drive, I tell you that uh, I did the Lagos Ibadan for four years when I was in, when I went for my law program. You can make Lagos Ibadan from the Ibadan end up to Shagamu, up to some point in Lagos, under one hour now. Hmm. It wasn't like that before. So on that aspect, I'm telling you that it did very, very well. So, it, it, so there are some areas, so it will be difficult for you to spoil him totally without segmenting some of these issues. But if I go to segment, as I said, the certain key area he built, but he has also tried his service. And government is a continuum. We are the ones going to mark his screen um, after he must have left off this. And I hope that uh, will be kind enough to him and his government. Chris Gendewando, always a delight to have you on Off the Press. Thank you so much for your time and insight today. Thank you very much. And a happy belated birthday to you once again. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Chris Kendewando, member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK, has joined us from Lagos on Up the Press this morning on Technofile Tuesday edition of The Breakfast. We'll take a break to give you the weather report. Do stay with us as we return after that with our very first hot topic of the day.